Welcome. Uh, thank you for your interest in learning more about planning for and living in retirement, part one. We know this topic is on the minds of a lot of people. Indeed, steady hand clients enjoy an average age of 57. So it's not surprising that hundreds of clients and their friends and family have tuned in today. We're absolutely thrilled to start our two-part cafe series with Don Ezra. I first saw Don at a Morningstar event on retirement issues just before the COVID lockdowns. Don captivated the audience and me with his wonderful stories and impactful insights. And reading Don's book, Life Two, was a big part of the inspiration for us to develop this cafe topic. Don is an accomplished pension expert. He is an actuary by training and a pension consultant by career. After arriving in Canada from the UK in 1971, Don established and led the global consulting group of Russell Investments for over 25 years. While Russell may not be a household name in Canada, in the pension and investment world, it's huge. Don has advised major pension funds and institutional investors the world over, and among his many accomplishments, wrote a column for the London Financial Times called The Art of Investing. Winding down a successful career that included working abroad in New York City, Tacoma, and London, England, Don dipped his toes into life after paid work, as he calls it, in 2010. He's been busy, however, having penned six books, including his two most recent ones, Happiness, and spoiler alert, The Best Is Yet to Come, and Life Too. He has an insatiable appetite for continuously learning and writing about issues related to retirement. And you need look no further than his website, donezra.com, and his blog, Life After Full-Time Work, where he is where he is preparing, where he's helping people prepare for a financial secure life after they finish full-time work. Don has just released his 151st blog post. Congratulations, Don. Thank you. Many of you have submitted great questions, some of which will be addressed in our discussion today, and some of which are more suited for our follow-up event in early March. Today's session is gonna focus on the social and emotional issues related to our topic, with a smattering of finance and investment ideas, while the second session taking place on March the 9th will address many of the tactical issues like tax-effective decumulation strategies, when to start taking CPP and OAS, and things like that. And we're fortunate to have two very experienced financial planners who will share, among other things, what's keeping their clients up at night, as well as some thoughts and tips on some costly mistakes that can be avoided. You'll have a chance to register for the next cafe and the communications that you receive from us after today's webinar, so keep an eye open for that. And we encourage you to share the recording of today's webinar with anyone you feel might benefit. So let's get started. Don, welcome, and thank you for helping us kick off our two-part series. It's great to have you join us today. Oh, it, it's not only a pleasure, it's an honor, David. Well, Don, we, we do have a full agenda, so let's, let's get at it. Um, in the closing paragraphs of your book, Life Two, you state, quote, for the most part, planning for Life Two is a mysterious, confusing subject that's best avoided because it causes anxiety and the only way to escape that anxiety is to avoid thinking about it. Now, I'm really happy that you wrote that so explicitly. I think it's absolutely true and it's worth sharing. It's just, you know, human nature. Because I think a big part of, the, of your book and what I took away is going to be able to get people more comfortable thinking about life after uh, full-time work, retirement. And I'm sure that today in our conversation, you're going to give our attendees more confidence in doing just that, thinking about life in retirement. Now, we've assembled 14 questions to guide our conversation discussion today, and you have a question for the audience. So we're going to engage all of you in a poll after the sixth of our 14 questions. So with that as an introduction, Don, um, there is a lot of meat to this, but before we get into the main themes that we want to cover, what is and how did you come up with this concept of satisficing versus optimizing things? It, it, it really is a good idea, isn't it? And, and because it's a good idea, you can be sure it's not my idea because I, I don't have good ideas. I just recognize them in others. So the word satisfice is interesting. It, it means just what it sounds like, a combination of satisfy and suffice, meaning something is pretty good, 
and that's enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. And it, it's an old Scottish word, apparently, that was uh, resurrected by Nobel Prize winner Herbert Simon. And I, I came across it when I was reading about how people make decisions. I mean, if you, if you put off an action or a decision until you're absolutely sure that it's optimal or perfect, well, that takes forever. And, you know, you're really never sure. So satisficing is a great solution. So you set a standard that's high, you search for solutions, and when you find a solution that meets it, you go ahead and use it and then move on. So it's, it's very practical. In, in fact, let me, let me give you an example. An, another Nobel Prize winner, Harry Markowitz, the father of modern portfolio theory, the father of the efficient frontier. When it came to assessing his own risk tolerance, he didn't know how to do it. And so he didn't know what his own asset allocation should be. And he said, you know what? I'm going to go 50-50. 50 equities, 50 fixed income. It may not be optimal, but it works. Wow. That is extraordinary. We, uh, those of us that have been around long enough at Steady Hand know that Tom Bradley coined a phrase that we use in, in our advice to clients, and that is approximately right. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. That's excellent. Yeah. So, Don, most people think of uh, the time after they've been working as retirement. Yeah. But you call it life, too. Why? Well, I, I hate the old-fashioned concept of retirement. So I, I used to call it graduating from full-time work. But life, too, is an absolutely accidental name. I, mean, I used to call it just simply life after work. But then I had a very precise friend who said, you don't really mean that, don't I? No, no, no. You mean life after full time work. I said, OK, yeah, it, it, it's the freedom from having to work full time that I'm really after. But just try saying life after full time work. You know, it, do, it doesn't roll off the tongue. So what do consultants do? We create an acronym. Life after full time work. L A. FTW, well, make that W O, L A F T W O, laugh too. And suddenly in my head, I was hearing a Texan friend of mine saying life too. <laughs> and, and once I got that name, life too, oh, a whole lot of things just fell into place. I mean, it's long enough to be a life in its own right. It, it's not just an afterthought from, from working, it's typically a happier life than what I now think of as life one. And just, a whole bunch of ideas like that suddenly fell into place, so I called it life too. Brilliant. I, my wife and I have a close friend of ours who just retired at the tender age of 60. Um, she was a senior partner in a public accounting firm, and that was their requirement. So at the tender age of 60, she thinks about the next stages in her life as rewirement. Yes. So she, she's busy restructuring, rewiring, and incredibly, uh, you know, focused and successful on 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 planning for that life too which is awesome oh, I, I love I love the word I love the idea anything that 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 looks forward I think is terrific um, we uh, we have this book called happiness and you say the best is yet to come you think you you write about retirement and life too as being arguably the happiest time of our lives. And, and I think there's some sort of empirical research and maybe some anecdotal evidence that would sort of back this up. But this is yeah. a little counterintuitive because, you know, yeah, retirement, you sort of last third of your life. That's right. People move into it with, with some fear because they've been so used to what they've had. There's, there's more than empirical research. Every year this goes on and on and on. The United Nations now publishes surveys on this. And, and so very consistently, surveys around the world say that, that when people are asked to rate their happiness, how it varies with age is interesting. I mean, it depends on a lot of things. Where, but, but if you isolate the effect of age and draw a curve, you always get a U curve. Um, so we're happy when we're young and we feel life is going to be great. I mean, what, what do we know? All we've been told is they lived, they lived happily ever after. Then, then we actually go into, into the world as adults and we encounter reality. And even though we have some great experiences, no question, there are always so many things that don't quite work right and they don't work the way we hoped and we feel frustrated. And then somewhere around age 40 to 45. Now, now, hang on, this is not individual. This is, these are national averages. 
um, individuals vary enormously. But the national averages tend to bottom out somewhere around 40 to 45 and then start going up again. And, and so by age 65 or 70, it's even higher than it was at the start. That's why I say the best is yet to come. Now, as it happens, this has absolutely nothing to do with retirement. I mean, there's a neurological reason for it. The dopamine that drives us to do things better and become more perfect um, tends to decline after the age of 40. And so we're less driven. And mm. therefore, we tend to judge life instead of by standards of perfection, by standards of satisfying. And so in a way, we see the glass as half full rather than half empty. So pretty good is pretty good. And, and it's good enough. And that makes us happy. And so it, it goes up after that. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was chatting this morning with a, uh, a senior person in our industry in the investment field, and um, he's 53 years old. Um, there's been some family health challenges, and he's decided to take, you know, effectively a, a two-year sabbatical. Uh, well, he has the opportunity to recalibrate, you know, rewire for uh, his next gig. He's not giving up on working. He still loves working. He's lo lots more to accomplish. But he said there's a 30-year to-do list that has been built up uh, yeah. over the course of time, which I think is part of what, you know, makes people in their sort of midlife unhappy. Is there's so many things that they they either need to do or want to do but can't do and fulfill their career and work obligations and family obligations at the same time. Um, so I think that's kind of consistent with your, your sequencing. Yeah, taking a sabbatical now might be a very good idea. So um, you had this incredibly intense career. Uh, you were operating at the highest level of your profession, advising the most sophisticated institutional investors in the world working with one of the most highly respected organizations in the world, living in you know, the financial capitals of the world, London, New York, Tacoma, Washington, um, <laughs> and, and Toronto. So you had, I mean, you, you were like, go, 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 top of your game. 2010, you retire. What was that like? Well, I was able to retire exactly when I planned. So I expected to be very happy. And I wasn't. It was exactly the opposite. In fact, I remember I remember the expression I used at the time. I said, I just feel totally discombobulated. I how you combobulate yourself again, I really don't know. But I mean, what, what I found was suddenly much of my day had no context. I mean, I, I loved my work, as you describe it. I mean, my work had a rhythm, it had a satisfaction that I loved, and I got totally used to it. And then suddenly I felt like a tree that had been uprooted. And so I had to become a new kind of tree. And I, I didn't know what kind of tree I wanted to be. I didn't know where I wanted to plant new roots. And in any case, new roots take time to dig in and become firm. And it, it, it was three years before I settled down again mentally and found a new purpose and new routines. Now, I wouldn't go back for anything. I've been asked many times, no chance. Hmm. And, and it's such a big difference from the way I felt initially that even though it was too late for me, I wanted to see, oh, I've been a consultant all my life, I wanted to see if I could help others not enter that happiest time of life with such fear. Hmm. And, and that's what started me researching what I wish I had done, what I wish I had known, etc. And, and the Life 2 book was then the result. Just out of curiosity, from the moment you retired in 2010 to the moment where that discombobulated feeling started waning because you now had this new sort of purpose-centered life too, how, how long was that period? It was about three years. Wow. And at the end of the three years, my wife and I made some decisions and followed through on them. And suddenly things got a lot clearer and a lot calmer. Okay. It's just I, I, there was just too much going on in my head, and I did I didn't know what was important and what wasn't. So it took three years to decide that. And being in that discombobulated state for three almost three years, you wouldn't have described that as a happy period. No, absolutely. Yeah. Even though it ought to have been the happiest period, I I I didn't. 
I, I wasn't aware of it, and, I, and it turned out I was afraid of it, even though I'd never thought of it that way. Right. Okay. Um, so the next question is, how should retire, retirees be thinking about and preparing for life after full-time work, given your experience? And specifically, what are some of the big rocks and scare, scary questions that we need to uncover or ask as we plan for this period of our lives? And when do we need to start thinking about them? I know there's a lot of questions there, but... Um, well, let, let's, let's start with the rocks. I love the idea of rocks because this is a voyage, and, and, and if we're going on a sea, we want to avoid rocks. And, and, and the more I researched it, the more it seemed to boil down to three large potential rocks. Some people avoid them all. Some hit one or more of them. And, and the, the, the rocks are about purpose and practicality and finance. Um, the purpose question is, it, it, it really starts from an identity question. We need to find a new answer to who am I? I mean, my friend, Professor Mayer Statman from Santa Clara, he wrote that when we lose a job, we lose more than money. We lose part of our identities. We, we, we lose pride in our accomplishments. We, we, we lose membership in a community that we've been very used to. And the more we enjoyed our work, the more time we spent at it, the more it defined us. Oh, we had a business card. This is me. What would we put on a new business card now? Right. Retired? My God, that's so negative. It's so backward looking. For myself, I am retired, but I deliberately put happily retired, trying to convey that I'm enjoying my life too, and I'm in control of it. And so it helps a lot if you have some sort of purpose. Of course, it's not essential for everyone to have purpose. I mean, if you can find a sort of happy groove to live in, that doesn't have to be any overriding purpose. That's okay. And in, in, in the Life 2 book, I mentioned four sets of questions you can tackle if, if you've hit that identity rock. Um, let me quickly tell you about one of them. Um, it, it, was, it was a set created by a guy called Ed Jacobson. And I heard it at a conference where he was presenting. And later I saw his book, Appreciative Moments, that goes into more detail. And this is a sort of exercise you can take not only at retirement or before retirement, but maybe every five years or so, every time your, your age reaches a multiple of five, that sort of thing. And what Ed says is this. He says, think of your life under seven headings. Now, I don't remember the seven headings he used, but I know how I remember them, and it's the same concept. I remember them in pairs with one extra because it's an odd number, and the pairs are family and friends, work and play, physical health and mental health, and he includes spirituality there. And then the seventh one, money. Oh, yeah, okay. So on each of these seven things, oh, he calls this, by the way, this is, this is what life's abundance gives you. And he calls it a life's abundance portfolio. And I think of these as seven asset classes. My geeky friends love the idea that happiness can be categorized under, under seven asset classes. But he says under each of these headings, rate yourself on a scale of one to 10. There are no right answers, no wrong answers. Only your own rating for yourself is relevant. What someone else thinks of you is absolutely irrelevant. And then decide which of those ratings you're happy with and which are the ones where you'd like to score higher. And then finally, what can you do? What is within your own capability to raise that score? So that's an exercise to take time over, you know, not, not to rush and say in an hour I can do the whole thing. But when you've done it, it starts to give you a sense of purpose, sometimes big purpose, sometimes day-to-day -day purpose. Um, and and, and that's, that's really very nice. So that, that was the first rock. This, I, I won't be as long with the others. The second, the second scary question is really, the practical one, how am I going to fill my time? Obviously, it's linked to the identity question. And I, I didn't know quite how to do this. And then I came across a book by Ernie Zielinski. It's called How to Retire Happy, Wild and Free. I mean, the title put me off for a while, but but uh, it's it's just a lovely, lovely book. And I, I had, it, 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 it's filled it's filled with ideas. Oh, wonderful, yes. Well, I had no idea who Ernie was. And so I researched, who is this fellow with all these good ideas? And turns out he's a Canadian. I got in touch with him, and he is a delightful, helpful person. So his book has tons of ideas, as well as a process for designing how to put those ideas together in a way that reflects you 
and satisfies you. So you end up personalizing the whole thing. I won't go any any further into that. I'll just I, I have no relationship with Ernie other than I really like the guy. But it's it's a terrific book. Yes, sir. I, I will say that on his book, How to Retire Happy, Wild, and Free, it goes on to say the byline is retirement wisdom that you won't get from your financial advisor. <laughs> Well, combine it because I mean, financial advisors are very, are very valuable. There's, there's one other aspect to how do I spend my time, um, and 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 that is really how to coordinate your life with your partner, because you're not just a couple; you're also two separate people, and so you do things together, but you also have your own interests. So you you need to be happy being a couple as well as being two separate people. Okay. Now the the, the third rock is money. And, and we financial geeks all know that many people wonder, will I outlive my assets? Uh, well, we, 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 can, we can get into this in a little more detail later, so let's, let's leave it at that. Oh, oh you, um, you, you said, when, when, when should we start thinking about this? So I think the one that takes the longest is the financial side. So for the money rock, I think we shouldn't leave it any later than maybe 20 years before your planned retirement. Actually, add another five, make it 25 years, because almost half of retirees, it turns out, are forced to retire earlier than they plan. It may be they're laid off, it may be their, their ill health, it may be the ill health of someone they have to look after. But give it 25 years, let's say. So you've got started, now with 25 years to go, um, it's time to get serious. And so it's now just time to start doing income projections, et cetera. 25 years is still long enough for compound interest to work its magic. Um, but it's time to start. Don't, don't leave it much later than that. But for the identity rock, I would say maybe two to five years before retirement, something like that. As I, as I mentioned, it took me three years before I finally resolved that identity, purpose, activity stuff, et cetera, in a comfortable way. And for me, it involved moving from the States back to Canada. It meant giving up a place we frequented in France because it no longer served the same purpose. So it's potentially not a quick change. Once have, you, you need to get used to, and I think therefore it's useful to start a few years before it actually hits you. I mean, the, the activity rock, well, avoiding, avoiding that probably comes from solutions to the other two questions, uh, except of course for the need for partner coordination. So give that a year or so before retirement. And, and Don, uh, you may or may not have an answer to this, but based on your experience and your discussions, and because you've had so much activity associated with this in the last uh, 11 years now, when you think about those seven asset classes of life's abundance portfolio, is there one that just sort of rises to the top as the one that was the most neglected prior to life two and that, that people sort of recognize as the most needs the most sort of uh, focus? I, I'm not aware of it. Um, yeah. Ed's book, Appreciative Moments, goes into it in more detail, but I don't recall anything that he found that most people seem to, to find lacking. Okay. I mean, in, in my own case, there was one that I thought was seriously lacking and enough time to start doing something about it. Um, yeah. But ne never, it, it's, it's very personal, so I won't go into that. Yeah, that, yeah, that, 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 there wasn't there wasn't a big one of the seven that I recall. I, f I find personally for myself, uh, when I was younger, we spent a lot of time with our friends, and then as we had our family and our careers dialed in, that's probably the one area where you know I I I, I would like to focus a lot more on my time and in, in sort of in sort of not repairing those friendships, but in investing in those friendships. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, a great comment about finance and rolling the clock back 25 years, take you know the power of compounding returns. Let's talk a little bit about something that is is in the investment sphere. You can't have return without risk. Right. And yet, you know, regulators kind of force a conversation around risk, which in some respects is not that relevant if you're an investor, because the focus there is on the volatility of returns. Uh, but admittedly, you know, volatility of returns is risk. So what, though, do, do you really think is risk when it comes to uh, the possibility of people outliving their money? Uh, and can you work this into a conversation that ultimately deals with this 
fabulously simplistic concept of your personally personal funded ratio. Yeah, um, e e everything everything I know I learned from working with the biggest DB plans around the world and and apl applying it to myself. But, oh, but jargon so, alert! Jargon alert! DB. Defined benefit. Defined. Be it, it's it's where it's where the benefit is defined and it, it's paid as opposed to you accumulate money and we don't know what it'll what it'll bring you. So it's it's the way things used to be. It's in in a way. Think of CPP OAS. They say here's the formula. Here's how much you'll get. And once it starts, it goes on forever. So those plans were the ones that I was most involved with. But okay. but start start with this whole notion of risk because you as you say when when you have a return, risk is automatically with it. And and the literal meaning of risk is the chance that there's a bad outcome. Well, bad is a vague word. I mean, what's bad varies from one person to another. I may be able to endure something that someone else really fears and the other way around too. So, so I think risk in life is a very personal thing. And in fact, for me, and I suspect for most retirees, risk is not so much an investment thing. Investments are contributed to risk, but risk is the chance that you won't be able to live the life that you want to lead. That's the real risk, and everything else feeds into that, and that's really psychological. But okay, if, if you want to translate it into investment terms, so be it. But but investment terms are not some investment terms are jargon oriented. Um, so you you mentioned that that uh, regulators in the industry and so on use volatility as the, as the standard risk measure. And I'm guessing for them there are, there, there are some reasons why they do this. I mean, one is that it's a measure that's common to everyone. Risk varies, what's perceived as risk varies, but volatility is a measure you can, you can measure for everyone. Um, and, and another one is that Harry Markowitz, whom I mentioned, um, used it as his risk measure when he came up 70 years ago with the nation of uh, the, 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 the notion of a risk return trade-off, which was a very novel idea because until then people never thought about risk. All they thought about was what's the return I expect. But I, I, I think I think that volatility and investment risk, I think that's 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 far too simple for retirees. I mean, even if we ignore their non-financial questions, because you mentioned another one. I mean, their finances really have two risks, not only investment return uncertainty, which is at least in the short term, well measured by volatility, but also longevity uncertainty, meaning you don't know how long you'll live. And it's, it's that longevity uncertainty that makes people really afraid that they're going to outlive their money. I mean, so much so that many people very substantially underspend what they could rationally afford to spend. I, I know there are Australian studies uh, to this effect. They show that uh, so many Australians leave an estate that is bigger than the amount they had when they retired. How does that happen? It means they're only living off the income. Why are they only living off the income? Because they're afraid the capital will run out. And the only certain way to make sure the capital doesn't run out is don't touch it. And, and that, that's fine if you're wealthy, but what a shame if you're poor or middle class depriving yourself out of fear. And it's, it's a fear that I think is is really unnecessary. And, and you, you, you mentioned my personal funded ratio concept. That's, that's the fear that I try to address on the financial side. I mean, it, 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 was, it was my own way when I graduated from full-time work of, of trying to solve that problem. Uh, and, and there was no help. I mean, people say baby boomers need help with retirement finances. Baby boomers? Hell, they're kids as far as I'm concerned. I was a World War II baby, so there was certainly no help for me when, when, when I retired. All I knew was how defined benefit plans work. And so I constructed a thought experiment. Defined benefit plans were, were closing. Um, let's project a defined benefit plan way into the future and suppose there are just two survivors left, no active members, two retirees left, my wife and me. And, and now, what advice would I give the trustees? And of course, with, if, if, if our ratio of, of assets to liabilities is less than 100%, um, nobody's going to put in any extra money for us like they do with the defined benefit plans. With us, we have to withdraw less money. So with that, with that change. But other than, other than um, that, the basic notion of the ratio of how much do we have and how much do we need for the life we want 
that's the extent to which the life we want is funded. So instead of the defined benefit plan funded ratio, I just call that my personal funded ratio. And, and essentially, if you're at 100% or above, oh good, and if you're below 100%, well, you've got less than you need, and, and, and you really ought to start thinking about making adjustments. And my very intelligent but non-financial wife um, understood that perfectly. And as it happens, we started off below 100%, and so that was a very easy, easy message to convey. It's gone above 100% since then, but it's, it, that whole concept ended up resulting in a plan that's very unusual relative to the advice I believe most people get. And when you were under 100%, you gave up the, uh, the summers in Nice? Yes, yes, yes. We've talked about this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I can, that, I can see that. I can see the. That's okay. It was less time. important. It was less important than getting to 100%. Yeah, I, I did the uh, personal funded ratio calculator uh, on your website uh, last night. Um, <laughs> so, and I'll, I'll I'll walk that I'll walk that through with uh, Jill this weekend when we have some time to talk about the uh, the solutions, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Well, I, yeah. You uh, you raised the issue of longevity. Yeah. And that is the great unknown. And uh, as part of your ongoing research, uh, we want to use this opportunity to dive into all of the the hundreds of people that are dialed into this uh, webinar and get your uh, response to a couple of poll questions. So all right. if, if you can pull up the poll and if everybody, there it is, um, okay. can... <laughs> Put your vote in that'd be great this so this is the first of two questions in the past 12 months have you looked up your own life expectancy have you gone to a stats canada or any other sort of internet-based website or otherwise to to look into that and simple I'm question to... yes or no <laughs> so i've submitted my response uh, lisa i don't have uh, any visibility into where we're at but if you could let us know when we hit about 80 percent completion that would be great about 82% of people have voted. Perfect. So why don't we uh, close that poll and move on to the second one. <clears throat> Thank you. That's awesome. And again, uh, let us know when you get to about 80% or so. So this is in addition to yourself, you're looking at the life expectancy for your joint and last survivor. So that would be for you and your partner. Yep, 80%, 84% uh, have voted. Perfect, let's close the poll and have a look at the results. Uh, Don, can you see those? Yes, 22.78, okay, yeah. That's, that's for the, well, uh, your well, own life. Well done, 22, yeah. <laughs> how, about, how about the uh, second poll? And 9% have actually combined it with, with, with a partner's life expectancy, well done. Any, anything short of 100% no is good because it means some people are already thinking about that. Excellent, I think that's excellent. Um, Don, I went on the uh, longevityillustrator.org site last night, and we're gonna include links to that incredibly rich uh, uh, data point um, in our, in our uh, post-event survey. So people have a chance to actually take that nine up to uh, perhaps 90. Um, did you, any other comments about uh, the longevity uh, poll there, the results are? No, it, it, it's, not, it's not a surprise at all. People fear it, and yet they know so little about it, they don't even know how to get it. So telling people about longevityillustrator.org, where they can get their own life expectancy and all that stuff, is really very useful because once you know, the fear starts to go away. Right. It's knowledge that dissipates the fear. So that's very useful. Well, according to the site, yeah, I have a 
100% chance of living for another three years. So I'm very encouraged about that. But when I told you that yesterday, you said, well, they rounded it up to 100. Yes, all, all their numbers are rounded. Whether it's life expectancy or percentages, they're all, they're all rounded. I, I, I'm terribly sorry, you're only 99 point something percent. Okay, um, so moving back into the uh, the financial side of things, uh, okay. you, you, you've done an awful lot of thinking, obviously as an actuary and as a pension consultant, about portfolio construction writ large. Now you have to deal with this portfolio construction for you and your wife, Susan. So how do you think about portfolio construction as you de decumulate your savings and investments? And can you give us a bit of a primer on this concept of sequence of risk return, sequence of return risk, but without even that level of jargon? Because people have to, that's an important concept uh, as you head into yeah. life after paid work. Yeah. Um, the sequence of returns risk is the risk that bad things happen in the early years after you retire. Because if you get bad returns in the early years and you're withdrawing money constantly, even if you get really good returns later on, you've got much less money earning that return. And so you may, you may never be able to restore the position. I mean, for simple numerical example, you make 0% a year for three years and 10% a year for the following three years. Sounds like an average of five, simple as that. But you'll have taken money out in each of the first three years. So there's much less left for the 10% to act on. Right. And, and so the opposite case would be, you get 10% a year for the first three years and zero after that, well, gosh, you're laughing. So the order in which the returns come right. is important when you don't have the same amount of money earning it. And, and the risk is for, for retirees, low returns early and high returns late. And, and in fact, for, for myself, that's a big risk that I try to counteract. For most of us, we're withdrawing money all the way through, so our peak assets are at the start. And if we have bad returns early, we'll never get a chance to recover. So what I did was I, I set aside five years of spending in what I think of as my, my self-insurance pot. Okay. And, and the rest is all in growth, so this is my growth part. If it doesn't do well in the first year, I'm not going to take any money out of it because I'm cashing in something that's depleted. So I will take the money just out of my self-insurance part. And I hope that sometime in the next four years, conditions will change and the growth part will recover, um, and then I can rebalance, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm protected for five years against low returns. Of course, if, if the market still hasn't recovered even after five years, then, then I'm in relatively bad shape and I have a bigger problem than just sequence of returns risk, but then so will the rest of the world have if markets fall and five years later they're, they're still down. We call that a, um, a spending reserve. You yes. refer to it as a sort of an insurance bucket. Yeah, yeah. Being an actuary, insurance is, is, is natural terminology for me. And, and, and so this is my self-insurance. I'm, I'm not giving it to any company. This is my self-insurance. Yeah. Okay. So five years worth of your deemed lifestyle spending requirements effectively in a cash-like vehicle, and then, yeah. and then the balance of the portfolio invested in an equity growth portfolio. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and the interesting thing is that if you're, let's say, five percent a year is 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 what is what we're withdrawing. That's five times that, twenty-five percent in right. cash-like stuff, but seventy-five percent in growth. Well, gosh, right. at the age of seventy-five, people think you should be much less than you should be seventy-five percent in 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 low-risk stuff. Right. But for us, what they're thinking of is when every year volatility is your enemy. Right. Volatility is only my enemy after five years. Right. And it's not just volatility, it's only going down. If volatility is on the way up, for example, 2021 was a great year. Yeah. So instead of taking one year's worth out of the out of the growth portfolio, growth pot and putting it in the self-insurance pot, I've taken several years worth. It's yeah. like saying the amount I wanted to get for several years I already got last year. Well, let's take it all out in one go. So now we've got many more than five years if the market should fall again. And I know you geeked out a little bit on that JP Morgan slide deck, uh, including the chart that shows 
the volatility of returns on a short one-year period, a three-year period of five, and a 10-plus year period. And right. you can feel fairly confident that in that five-year you know, rolling uh, period, your uh, your growthy returns are not likely to be negative. In fact, they're likely to be handsomely right. positive. Right. What's interesting, though, um, and, and this is getting into in, in, into a lot of detail. What's interesting is that about 25% of the time in the last hundred years, that's actually happened. Yeah. That that it hasn't recovered in real terms. But that was mostly through the depression. The most recent time that happened, I think, was starting in 1973 or thereabouts. Anyway, but that's 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 a lot of detail. Okay. Well, uh, staying in that sort of geeky mode for a moment, uh, we have longevity uh, as as arguably, you know, it's a challenge, but hopefully people see it as an opportunity. And you've got sequence of return risks. In your book, you talk a little bit about, you know, which is larger, which is more menacing, uh, how should you think about this, and how should you ultimately mitigate these risks? Well, you know, these two risks, um, not just sequence of return risk, but all kinds of investment risk, including the fact that just in the long term, things don't go well at all, um, and longevity risk, they're, they're both forms of uncertainty, and they are so massive that they, they form a horrendous problem. I mean, another Nobel Prize winner, Bill Sharp, called this the nastiest, hardest problem in finance. How much can I withdraw, given the uncertainty in both of these? And they're certain, it's certainly far too difficult a problem for me to solve. So the way I solved it for myself is to simplify it by dividing it into two problems. And I conducted a thought experiment. So let's... let's let, Hey, you change the context and all kinds of things change. So let, let, let's imagine life on two hypothetical and, and very peculiar planets. These are not in the solar system. So on planet A, everybody lives to exactly their life expectancy. There's no uncertainty there at all. But investment returns are uncertain. So obviously the amount of money you need to set aside is also uncertain. On planet B, investment returns are absolutely certain. You know exactly what you're going to get but you don't know how long you're going to live. And again, the amount of money you need is uncertain. And the question I ask myself is, on which planet is the uncertainty greater? And the answer turns out to be, it depends on your age. So I did started this some time ago. I, I started at a young age, male age 60, at least in average health. Longevity uncertainty, longevity causes less financial uncertainty than being 100% invested in fixed income no growth whatsoever so you know most people will say yeah yeah yeah, that, that's comfortable no problem but as you age those two tend to get closer together then they cross over and by the time you reach male age 75 the financial uncertainty caused by longevity is bigger than the uncertainty caused by being 100 percent in equities mm -hmm. And most 75 year olds would say 100% in equities, don't be silly, that's way too risky for me. Well, if that's too risky for them, then if they were aware of how much risk there is in uncertain longevity, they would have, they would have done something to hedge their longevity risk by age 75. By the way, add, add five years for a female, so female 65, female 80 for the same conclusions. Okay, so how do you mitigate these risks? Well. There are books and books and books on that. So let, 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 me, let, let me give you a greatly oversimplified answer. And again, this is for a, a person or a couple in at least average health. So, so divide your, your, lifetime, your, 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 your lifestyle spending, the expenditures you want. Divide it into two parts. Needs, stuff you absolutely could not live without no matter what, and wants stuff you'd love to do, but which if you absolutely had to, you could. You wouldn't enjoy giving it up, but you could give it up, the needs and wants. So start with the needs. So compare the needs with the income you're going to get that's guaranteed to last a lifetime. So you've got CPP, you've got OAS, you've got defined benefits from a guaranteed defined benefit plan, etc. Add up all of those. If that source of combined source of income is not enough for your needs, you might consider buying an annuity from an insurance company for the difference. And now your needs are locked in. So you've got the rest for your wants, or 
you may have enough just from CPP, OAS, and the pension plan, and, the, and everything is now available for once. So assuming you still need some investment growth to get your personal funded ratio up to 100%, there are many approaches. I mean, one has only recently become available, and so far as I know, just in, in, in Canada and, and Australia, but it's a longevity pool that guarantees income for life. No guarantee about the amount, but it will not run out in your lifetime because of the actuarial formula they use, which work. Yeah. Or you can do what I do. I planned for a life, because, because I started this before this longevity pool was available. I planned for a lifetime that was longer than our joint and last survivor expectancy. And so, never mind how I calculated that, but I wanted that. And then I, hold, I held five years in, a, in, in the self-insurance part and the rest in, the, in a global equity index fund, reduce fees, all that good stuff. I mean, there are reasons for why five years, how to select a planning horizon. Um, I, I've written articles for London Financial Times. Actually, there's, there's a piece in my website, the, la the, latest, the latest piece is on that too. An Australian website published it and it was one of their top 10 pieces with 20,000 hits, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, so, the, the, those, those, those are my thoughts, that you can spread it out over a longer period than you require um, with the self-insurance bucket and then the growth bucket. Um, you must have other ways as well to, to mitigate those risks because you know your clients and it's very much a question of what are, the, what are the risks they take personally, what are their needs, what are their wants. So talking to someone about it is probably the best way to start. When you describe those two... Uh those two worlds, in reality, we have a foot planted firmly in both of them. Yes. So yes. we don't live on either one. Uh, that's, the, that's the only way I could solve the problem, by two, by two simplified worlds. Uh, we have a little, we only have about 12 minutes left and we've got a few questions to get through. So I think this is an important uh, one though, given that we're living uh, an inflation, inflationary period. How should retirees incorporate inflation risk into their planning? Is inflation risk uh, bigger for people in retirement than people that are still working? I know you've done some thinking about this. Yeah, um, basically I would ask you how to hedge inflation risk. Um, in, in the short term, real return bonds and stuff, but they're very, very expensive. The yields are very, very low. Um, in the long term, you don't so much hedge inflation as try to beat it with equity life securities, alternatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I would ask you about yeah. how to hedge inflation. Um, but is it a bigger problem for retirees? Yes, um, because once you've retired, there are your assets and that's all there is. Whereas at least before you're retired, you have the option of saving more, you could retire later, et cetera, et cetera. So you have more options. And this is one reason why retirees are much more risk averse than working people. And uh, for uh, steady hand clients that would like to delve into our views on inflation, um, we have talked about this extensively at our mid-year review last June, I think, or July, I think it was, which is um, in video format, uh, as well as uh, we've touched upon it in our year-end review as well. So if you want to go to our steady hand YouTube channel, you can uh, find those, um, those videos there. On this theme of um, sort of assumptions about the future, what, what do you use for planning your your and Susan's um, personal funded ratio, like returns, inflation, fees, and then yeah. there's this other concept called that you have called budgeting margins. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I, I, I put inflation in implicitly because I assume everything goes up with inflation, and so I want our returns to be net of inflation and I want our returns to be net of fees. So I don't have any explicit things about fees and inflation, but I need returns net of, net of them. And what I used at the time seemed very conservative historically. For my, for my self-insurance part, I use a 0% real return every year. And for the growth part, I used 4% a year in real terms. Today, you would think those are probably on the high side. You might, you might go closer to minus one and three. And so yeah. I would expect that much of the time I would have to be adjusting. And how, we, how do you adjust? You adjust by taking out less. I don't move everything 
according to the funded ratio. What I do is, again, what defined benefit plans did. When they were underfunded, they didn't say, well, what's the lump sum we need to put in and put it in? They would spread it over the rest of their planning horizon. They called it amortizing the deficit. Well, we do the same thing when we were underfunded. What we did was we spread the amount over the future planning horizon we had. And so that's, that's, that's how we adjust it. But, it. but as I mentioned, the reverse happens too. So in a bumper year like 2021, we where instead of if every 4% gives you a year's worth that you cash out, well, if you get many years worth, take, up, take the opportunity and cash out many years worth. Right. Because that money is there. And what you're trying to do is reduce risk, which is the risk that you don't have enough now so that's that's that that's that's what we ended up doing um the the margins um david blanchett did some some great work where he looked at american spending patterns in retirement and he divided them into three phases of life go go where you're doing everything and then after a while you don't do as much and then he said that's slow go so you're spending less uh -oh. Then if you're un unlucky, you have the no-go stage where you're in long-term care. But he said, in general, it's kind of like, like a curve that goes down and might go up a little at the end. So he called it the retirement smile. But best of all, he actually estimated what the effect was. And this is, again, for the average American couple. So it, it, it may not apply to anyone in the audience. But in general, he said, because in general things are going down, you don't, you're not spending as much, so you don't need to keep pace with inflation fully. If you keep pace with inflation minus one, that should be enough. And, and, and so um, for us, one of our margins is we just base it on inflation. Okay. And another margin is we base it all on the go-go years and when slow-go comes, which will be later for my wife than for me, because she's somewhat younger, um, things will go down and then after the first passing which again is more likely to be me than her um we're assuming things will go on in a constant amount so we have a number of these margins built in just in case um okay anyway. i have two two last questions and i know this is on the minds of a lot of people um what advice do you have for families how huh. should how should aging parents prepare their adult kids for an uncertain future well, this again is an area where I would ask professionals for their input. I, I, I can tell you what we did, and, and this has gone down in family legend as dad's decumulation talk, so you, you, can, you can imagine. Um, but I, I must have behaved myself because um, it, 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 it opened things up. It became a real bonding experience with the kids, and it had the, that was the unexpected bonus. But um, so, so now they talk about their own finances, not just about our finances and things like that. And neither Susan nor I ever had that kind of discussion with our parents. But I think, I think in general, there are sort of three dimensions in a conversation, in, in all conversations between parents and kids. The first is obviously a list of important documents where they're to be found, preferably in one place known to the kids. <laughs> there are lists on many websites, but obviously assets, liabilities, legal documents, people to be contacted, etc. So that's that's the, the first dimension. The second dimension relates to what level of involvement you want your kids to have. I mean, the least involved level is where your kids know where to find the information. Um, next, you may actually want to share some of that information, such as your finances and your will, and that's what Susan and I did. I mean, the thing is, one day it may be necessary for them to assist us or to share responsibility for our affairs, or even take over that responsibility completely. So we've consulted them before making our wills and all that sort of thing. And that, that gives not only peace of mind for us, that gives peace of mind for the kids, because very often kids are worried about whether they, they have to support you financially at the end. And so I say for your kids' sake, don't leave this conversation so late that your mental capacity is declining and you still haven't had the conversation. And I think that the third dimension is not nearly as serious, but it, it involves it involves potentially saving some trouble for your executor after you've gone. Mm. And it, 
the angst that arises from small things like dividing up your personal possessions when different family members each want the same thing or they think a particular apportionment or a method of deciding isn't, isn't good. And this came to me after reading an article many years ago in the New York Times where the author said, I mean, just, just think what it would be like for a second if on Christmas morning all your children rush downstairs and there are all of these presents bright and shining, big and small, and no name tags on them. Imagine the free-for-all that would ensue. So that got to me, and that's why I mentioned it, even though it probably would never make anybody's list of really important financial things to consider. But these are emotional things, and, and emotional things are important too. I, 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 my wife and I read a book about five or six years ago called Willing Wisdom, and it gave us a ton of inspiration for having these conversations, not just with our children, but also with our parents. Um, so I would I would encourage anybody that wants to know more about that to uh, consider picking up that book, Willing Wisdom. Last question, uh, Don, uh, you've you've got some thoughts on how to maximize or at the minimum satisfy the relationship that somebody has with a subject matter expert, whether it's a doctor or a financial advisor. Yeah. And I think in light of the circumstances today, it would be great if you could provide your guidance to our clients on how they should be working with us and of course other advisors in their lives yeah um, i i think i think we all tend to be afraid of talking to a subject matter expert because well they're the expert what do we know but I, th I think there are there are some things that it's okay for us to say and feel comfortable saying i mean one is quite simply would you give me some, some advice i don't get it please put it more simply than that speak my language i along with other geeks tend to use jargon an awful lot. So speak my language and we don't we don't realize it. So the client's language is important. And also I, I, I think it's perfectly okay to ask, um, tell me what your recommendation is based on. I mean, is it based on years of research? Is it based on the, the assumption, the hope that the future is gonna turn out like the past? I mean, that'll give you some idea of, of, of what's behind it. And I think the, the last thing is that in any conversation with a subject matter expert, we ourselves are the subject matter expert about ourselves. We know about ourselves and the subject matter expert has to get that knowledge transferred to them. So um, I think it's a good idea to ask something like, please tell me how you understand my goals and how the things you recommend will help me get to my goals. I mean, that's the way advice becomes personalized uh, rather, than, rather than off the cuff. And it, it tells us if we haven't explained ourselves adequately to the expert. So it's, it's great communication. I mean, you, you, you mentioned doctors, not just um, financial experts. I mean, um, I do this with my doctor. We have lovely conversations. I mean, I love the fact that now he knows exactly how, how to get into my head. And I feel we have a close relationship, even though he's the expert and I know not, nothing medical. I think these conversations tie you together and, and they start creating friendships, not just client relationships. Couldn't agree more. And a real shout out of encouragement for our clients to to just keep asking us questions uh, until you really are confident and comfortable with our advice and uh, with your plan. So, Don, we're approaching the uh, the hour, um, and so I I'll close it out now by saying I speak for everyone who's tuned in today when I thank you for your wonderful insights that you've shared with us. It's been a lot of fun I, for me anyhow, and I think it's been beneficial to have a front row seat really into your research, your ex personal experiences, your informed perspectives, and your writing. Uh, we thank you very much for indeed sharing your wisdom. And thank you to our clients and their friends and family and everyone who follows Steady Hand who attended today for your enthusiastic response to this first of our two-part series on retirement. We've been overwhelmed with the level of interest that you have. Immediately after this webinar closes, you'll be directed to complete a very brief survey, but don't worry, it's just three questions. And to entice you in that survey, we've included the links to Don's website and his detailed writing on Freedom, Time and Happiness, which is the companion online piece to his book, Life Two, as well as the links to the calculators that Don mentioned, including the personal funded ratio calculator and the longevity illustrator. 
Now, looking forward to March and the second webinar of our two-part series on retirement, we will be speaking with two leading independent objective advice-only financial planners, Karen Mizgala and Jason Heath. This session will focus on some of the frequent questions that retirement planners face, including, how do I know if I have enough? When, will I, uh, when shall I take or defer CPP and OAS? And does it ever make sense to convert an RSP to a RIF before I turn 71? And Karen and Jason will share several tips and planning tactics together with the top worries that are on their clients' minds and some costly mistakes that can easily be avoided. And of course, we'll be answering many of the other questions that we've already received from you. So that's it for today. In closing, a reminder, if it's applicable, don't forget to make your RSP and TFSA contributions in that window. And if you have any questions about your portfolio or would like our advice, we're just a phone call away. We look forward to hearing from you. Again, Don, thank you very much and best wishes, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Th thank you, David. I'm looking forward to joining your next one. Awesome. Thank you. I will be there. Thanks.